There's a place I want to go Where the streets are paved with gold It's called heaven Heaven And it's far beyond the sky In the street by and by Oh heaven Sweet heaven Get your ticket today And all you have to do is pray And ask God to come into your life No sickness, no pain Everybody knows your name In heaven In heaven Don't you want to go, don't you want to go Don't you want to go, don't you want to go to heaven Heaven don't you want to go, don't you want to go, don't you want to go, don't you want to go to heaven, sweet heaven. We'll walk the streets of gold and we'll never grow old in heaven, sweet heaven. No darkness, no night, God lights up the sky in heaven, sweet heaven. Get your ticket today All you have to do is pray And ask the Lord to come into your life No sickness, no pain Everybody knows your name In heaven, sweet heaven Don't you want to go, don't you want to go Don't you want to go, don't you want to go to heaven Sweet heaven don't you want to go, don't you want to go, don't you want to go, don't you want to go to heaven, sweet heaven. Good morning and welcome to Community Life Church. I am Kat Seiler, the Director of Adult um, ministries here, and we are so honored that you've decided to join us, whether you are here in person or joining us online, welcome. To start everything off, we would ask that you please stand, and we are going to join our hearts together and pray the Lord's Prayer. Will you pray with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. From thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father God, we thank you for today, and we thank you for this opportunity to gather in this place with other believers to focus on you. So much goes on beyond these doors, and sometimes we can get really caught up in it, and especially as we're moving towards the fall, Father, there is so much excitement because things are taking one more step back to normal. And Father, as we move into that time, help us to remember to focus on you, to center our lives on you. We ask your blessing on Pastor Scott's message today, and we give this day up to you and do all of this in your son, Jesus Christ's most holy and precious name. Amen. Welcome, everybody. Let's worship together this morning. Who am I that the highest king would worship?
So in an, an attempt to try and follow our routine and find something clever or relevant to say today, I realize that it's not always necessary to do that because sometimes his presence alone is enough. And if I can just get myself out of the way or we can get ourselves out of the way, the music will speak for itself and he will move. The Holy Spirit will find this place and allow us to truly experience what the heart of worship is. So let's just take a moment Take a deep breath and do that this morning. Where you go, I know 
thank you for your presence here today. We're so grateful for the opportunity to worship together knowing it was made possible by the sacrificial love of your son, Jesus. So today we choose to focus our hearts and minds on you and your word. I pray a special blessing over Pastor Scott as he delivers the message today. And in the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Everybody's doing good this morning. I want to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us today at Community Life Church on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. It's it's hanging on. No, no, no. It's going to be beautiful from here on out. And for those who are logging in online from around the world, it's been raining off and on today, but it's nice. It's nice inside. So thank you all so much for being here today. Um, Whether you are here in person or logging in, um, we appreciate it. There are a lot of places you could be on a Sunday morning, and we are honored uh, that you're here with us today. Um, love to see the, the pictures of all the volunteers doing what they're doing. You're going to get to hear a little bit more about that at the end of the service today. But um, we are four weeks away from our fall launch. How many of y'all are ready for new? Like not, like, not new, but things to get back to whatever they were. Like, like rhythm? You guys good with that? Y'all no? No. Y'all are killing me. Um, I'm just ready to get back into a rhythm. I'm a rhythm guy, and I know that in the fall, people will be back in school, people will be back to work, and hopefully we can kind of get back on with life, uh, whatever that couple-year process that we had going on there in the middle. But so glad to have you here today. At Community Life, we love God, we love our neighbor, and we believe that our mission is to connect people to Jesus, because we believe that Jesus is the source of life. And so if today you need to know a source of life, if you need to be connected, let us know. We'll connect you. Um, I know that as a church, we're not always going to be perfect in the way that we do that. And so if there's something that we can do, uh, please let us know and we'll pull right alongside you uh, in this journey. So we're going to jump right into our series today. So we're in a series on Colossians, which is really a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the city of Colossae to speak to the believers that were there during that time. And I've been enjoying going through this because anytime you study a letter or you study something like this, you have to dive into the context of what was going on then, what was going on in the world, in that city, what was, what were their, what was their trade about, their industry, some of the things they struggled with, because that's what this letter would have been dealing with. And as we study and we learn about Colossae, it opens up for us Maybe some of the parallels that we struggle with today that maybe uh, relate to the scripture, relate to our lives, so we can take this truth and add it to who we are. Also for me, if you've never really studied the Bible, you start to recognize that, that Colossians is, the pattern of Colossians as a letter is really a lot of our New Testament. There are a lot of letters Um, to be read to those different communities about the things that they were going through. So if you've never studied the Bible before, you're getting a unique opportunity to study 
um, some of the writing that was there, and maybe it'll open up a whole section or a whole swath, if you will, of the Bible for you to jump into. So uh, we're looking at this letter to the Colossians, and I'll just go ahead and tell you up front, uh, it was written by the Apostle Paul. Um, He's one of the the bigs of the faith, if you will, during this time, and most biblical scholars believe that he wrote it around 60 AD while he was under house arrest in Rome. So if the resurrection of Christ took place around 30-ish, Paul started serving God five, seven years later, somewhere in that time frame, or how many ever years later. This is a seasoned writer. So Paul is writing maybe 25 years into his ministry. The truth that he captures um, is, it's really rounded, it's really deep, it's developed his thought um, and, and how he, he writes in this letter. And so just, I've been really enjoying the pieces of theology that he puts together. So he writes the letter um, by invitation of a person named Epaphras, who while Paul was under house arrest, this person Epaphras goes to Rome and meets him and tells him about this church in Colossae that, that, is, uh, that is struggling in, in certain areas. And so Paul takes the challenge and he writes to them. And um, just to let you know a little bit about the town or city, it used to be a huge city known for its trade, known for its agriculture. Well, an earthquake in 17 AD messes up the road that ran through there during the time. And so Rome rebuilds the road, but builds it farther to the north. And so this city suffers quite a bit of loss and trade and all of those things are down. So it's a much smaller version of maybe what it was at one time. Colossae is known for its agriculture. It's also known for its, its trade in the textile industry, if you can say industry in relation to the Bible. Um, so in textiles, there were plants, flowers that grew there. And when they would take those flowers and they would crush them, they, it made this dye that they could then take and they could dye the wool. And the wool would turn into this beautiful purples, blues, uh, burgundies that were really sought after. And so you have this community that has a really unique nature about it. And um, some of the struggles that they dealt with in the community were just like uh, many of the, uh, the, the cities and around during that time, there was a lot of beliefs in other gods And so Paul's target at Colossae was for them to be anchored in Christ, not to allow these other belief systems to pull them away from what they believed. So we started in chapter one, and uh, as we dove into it, he opens up greeting everybody, and then he has this amazing prayer, which we encourage you to go back and study and look at. But then at the end of chapter one, he leaves them with a hymn about the supremacy of Christ, Um, that not only was Jesus supreme over all of creation, that then when he died and was the first to rise from the dead, he became the supreme over the new creation. So here this Jesus is that is supreme over everything. And that truth in chapter one, he uses to inform the next three chapters. And so that, that understanding of Jesus as being supreme blends into the next few chapters and really informs the rest of our writing. Last week, we looked at chapter two, And I think the biggest point and takeaway, and I'm, you know, I I love to take and boil things down. In chapter two, verses six and seven, Paul literally says to them, go live your life. Go live your life in Christ. You ever have somebody who, who gets too bound up in all the things that are going on around them? I mean, if you watch news for about five minutes, you get all frustrated and crazy and you want to shake someone and say, go live your life. Like, like the way that you know that you can live it. Well, six and seven is him saying that exactly. Go live your life in Christ. And then he puts three qualifiers on it. He says, live your life in Christ, be be rooted, built up, and established. So remember, it's an agricultural community. So to be rooted means Christ becomes your source, becomes the life that's given to you. And if you take a plant and you put it in the ground and it has a good root system and you have a good source of, of energy, then that plant will be built up, it will grow, it will produce fruit, so be rooted, built up, and then he adds this truth of being established in the faith. And you, you think of, of a forest, or you think of a garden that's been planted well and cared for. When something is established, then it is in a system where the nutrients are generated, where life is given, it's protected um, in our lives. If you're planted and you're established in a, in a community of faith that, that holds you accountable, but also loves you, that encourages you, then you're established in the faith, the ability to continue to grow. And so live your life in Christ. That, that's what he tells them in chapter two. Everything else around verses six and seven 
He deals with the things in life that try to take us away or try to pull us from that truth of being anchored. And so today, now, we move into chapter three, and I'm just going to go ahead and warn you right up front that I am about to oversimplify chapter three in a way that may make you hate me. No, you won't hate me, but you'll be like, uh, surely there's more to it than that. Um, I'm about to oversimplify chapter three, and when I do, some of y'all are going to pester me about it later. I'm just, just going to go ahead and say that. So remember, agricultural community, they also are a, a textile community, so dealing with wool. And what we do in chapter three, coming on the heels of him saying, live your life in Christ, now in three, he starts to make it practical. And here's the very simple message. Imagery. You ever been to a fashion show? I have not. Some of y'all are like, oh, yes, you have. Ever been to a fashion show um, where you have uh, different outfits and you have a presentation of what somebody wants you to live into and someone wants you to wear and clothes are presented in such a way that, that they try to draw you into either purchasing their fashion or liking their fashion? Well, to me, the oversimplification is that chapter three is a fashion show. Hate me for that later, but that's exactly what it is. It's the things we're going to put off and the things that we're going to put on. In fact, Paul uses in his terminology those exact phrases, clothe yourselves in, put on. He uses terminologies like image or set your mind on things in a different place. He uses that to allow us to, to be aware of the way that we should live life. And so telling us to live life and now starting to make it practical we can see how he does this. And maybe because Colossae deals in that textile industry, maybe for him, this is a way to connect that makes sense to them. So here's the breakdown of, of verses 1 through seven, or 16, 17. Verses 1 through 4 is a bookend, and 17 is a bookend for the fashion show. So we're going to set up Christ on both ends, and then we're going to talk about what that doesn't look like and what it does look like, and we're going to work through the process in the middle. And you're going to hear a sermon like you've never heard ever before, okay? This is already starting off. Some of y'all are totally non-responsive right now, and that is making me very, very nervous. You're like, I'm going to head for the truck. Give it about three minutes and meet me there, right? Those are the conversations y'all are working through right now. So let's start with the bookends. So in chapter 3, verse 1, he says this. He says, so... If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So right off the bat, you have to recognize that he's speaking now to the people who are believers, that you have been raised with Christ. He's drawing from the imagery of chapter two, where he talks about our lives being enveloped and being surrounded and, and pulled into Christ, the creator versus the creation. Now we are a part of that. So he says, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think about the imagery of, of, a, of a show where you are trying to produce an image. You want to put forward the thing that, that you want people to look like. In advertisement, it's done all the time. This is what you want to look like, right? So you see it and you're thinking, I got to work out. I got to do this. I got to get by those clothes. This is what he's doing. He's putting Christ out there and he's saying he's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. So set your mind on him. Verse 2. Um, he says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. L listen to the power of verse three. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So when you became alive in Christ, it's important for you to know that your, your life is gone. That you now become the image bearer. That's probably the best choice in light of what we're gonna talk about today. You become the image bearer of Christ. Your life is no longer your own. Now you bear the image of Christ. And so you can see how he's presenting and how he's putting that forward as, as starting the conversation leading into chapter three. And then if you just flipped over to verse 17, he closes off. That's what we're going to be looking at. That's what we're focusing on. Now he closes off by talking the way that we're going to do, how we're going to live life. He says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So the bookends for chapter three are Jesus, focusing on him, being aware of his image, and living life in, in the name of Christ. Those are those two, two sections. Now before I move on, let me just throw a question out there. What would happen if we truly understood this? 
Like, what would happen if we truly thought, or I, maybe not thought, understood, became aware of the fact that wherever we go, whatever we do, that we represent Christ. That when we chose this journey of faith, that we said, Scott, no more. I'm about Christ. And that's the image that I have to put forward. Because I'm going to tell you that that's a, that's a different thought. Usually in our theology, we try to figure out what God has to say about our lives. Is that not, not correct? I mean, that, that's kind of what we do. We're like, how does God inform my life and so I can do something different? The theology he's teaching here is that our lives are gone and now we become the image bearers. And then he's going to teach us as to what that looks like going forward. So just wrestle with that a little bit. And I'm just going to go ahead and throw another verse out there. If we believe in John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his son, and we understand that Jesus was the image of the father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. If we understand that that is the greatest expression of love, then we have to wrestle with the fact that we then are also the ones that are sent, that we are an expression of love to the world to be presented as the image bearers of Christ. That's what Paul is putting together in this chapter three. Our lives are no longer our own. Now we become the standard, the image bearers, so that others can look at us and they can see Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, for Christ so loved the world that now he sends us to bring this message to someone else. That's Scott chapter one, verse one. I'm just gonna throw, that's not in scripture. I'm just trying to draw a comparison for you. So now let's go back and dive into this scripture and look at all of these verses in between. So verses five through nine, um, this is the old image, the thing that we want to get rid of. So he starts off by saying, put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these things, or on account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. So to live in these ways means destruction for you and your life. It's not in keeping with the image that we want to hold on to. Verse seven, these are the ways that you also once followed when you were living that life. So before you gave up your life, when you gave up your life, you, you turn loose of all these things, no longer to live in them. So you can already see this is like presenting the image of what we don't want people to look like. So go back to that idea of, of a fashion show or, or giving you an image to live into this is the life that we don't want you to live into. So let's go back and look at verse five. He starts off and he says, put to death therefore. So that word therefore tells you that this section of scripture is referencing above. So if you want to live into this life that's enveloped in Christ, we're going to do this. But he starts off with put to death. And if you open up and you study the Greek, it's a real interesting term and meaning for put to death. Do you know what it means? Put to death. It's exactly what it means. Y'all like, hate when I do that, don't you? It literally means to obliterate, to get rid of, to not have this in your life, to when this stuff starts to show up, you get rid of it totally and completely. That, that, he uses such strong terminology here to say that these things shouldn't be a part of your life anyways. And, and the list, and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, this is not an exhaustive list because where's murder? Where are all those things? He's not trying to list everything. He's trying to give you things that are in keeping with not God. So fornication, that's sexual immorality. Impurity is what we talked about last week, a buffet line of faith. I'm going to take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of all these different things, and I'm going to mix it up and, and I'm going to have a different faith system outside of my, what my faith teaches me. Passion, that would be lust, evil desire. Have you ever met somebody that's just, they're just evil. Like their hearts are always turned in the wrong direction. You don't trust them as far as you can throw them. That's that evil desire. And greed is truly just being selfish. I, he calls it idolatry. But if you are a greedy person, that means you care more about yourself than anybody else on the planet. He says these particular areas, when you died to yourself, they should already be gone. But in your life, put them to death. Get rid of them totally and completely. They shouldn't be a part of you at all. So he starts off by, by saying that. Now I love in verse eight, this is where you start to get the shift. So imagine you're at a, at a, a, a fashion show and you present the things you don't want people to look like. And then the MC comes out and says, but now, because that's what verse eight starts off with. 
So here comes the transition and a different way to think. He says, but now you must get rid of all such things. All such things means this is not an exhaustive list. Here's just a few ideas. Get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, and malice. Those are attitudes that that harm other people. And then he gives some specifics of ways that we hurt with our mouth. Slander, abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. He says, but now get rid of all these things. So if we put to death all the rest of that stuff, these are things that we're going to wrestle with every single day. That if something happens to you, you might get angry. Get rid of that thing. Figure out how to navigate through that particular moment to turn that into something else or to use it in a way that, that is designed that we understand scripture. Get rid of those things. Let's move into a way where all of that stuff starts to find its own place and find its way out of our life. So you can start seeing the, the, the transformation of the language and how he deals with this and how he talks about this particular moment of scripture. Um, he goes on to say, uh, do not lie to one another, verse nine, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self. So you can see the terminology about garments. So, so strip off the old self, start to clothe yourself with the new self, And this next verse, or the rest of this verse, is so key to life and understanding the balance, right? Because I think sometimes people think if you become a believer, the next day you're supposed to be perfect. And if somebody thinks that, you should probably stay away from them. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, And here's, here's what it says. It says, clothe yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of its creator. So here's the process. As you garner knowledge about the image of the creator, as you learn, as you grow, as you understand Christ, as you understand the truth, then there's a renewal that starts to happen into our minds that allows us to become and grow into the image that God has called us to. But it's so important to understand that is being renewed. It'd be easy to listen to a sermon like this and think, man, I'm terrible. Like, I'm not even close. Anger is, 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 I'm not good with that whole thing. I'm not good with whatever. Fill in the blank on any of that stuff. So Scott, I'm, I'm no good for anybody. If you're at that point, this is great. You've heard the message and you know that you can start. And you can allow the image of the creator, which looks different than that, to start to inform life. And as you start to transform your life in light of this, then there's the different image that's, that's presented does that make sense to everybody? Um, I, I love that there's, a, that there's a growth in this process. It's, it's speaking of transformation. It's not a one and done. It's a, it's a continual growth in a relationship, learning about God, learning about the nuances, allowing that to impact us, and allowing ourselves to be renewed. Verse 11, he brings in a greater truth, and I think this is so powerful and, and even a word for our society today. He says, in that renewal... So in that continuing to understand the image of its creator, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. And so he says, and and so in that renewal of your mind, I want you to know that there are no more of these boundaries that separate us. And he lists race, he lists culture, he lists, he lists social standing, all the things that we're all fighting about nowadays. What Paul does so beautifully is he connects us at a higher point. Because in just a moment, he's going to give us some verses that allow us to all be connected to the heart of God in ways that don't separate us. And so he's just saying in all of these areas, understand that the, the normal boundaries that trip us up, that don't allow us to, to connect with one another, we're trying to maybe connect on the wrong levels. How about we connect with Christ and then we can celebrate those differences and we can become something beautiful in this calling or in this family that he's called us to be a part of. And so what he does, he connects us to something higher, a higher awareness. And here's where it starts to unfold in verse 12. As God's chosen ones, Holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with, so here's here's your fashion show, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. And so there's your model, there's the one that we're going to focus, there's the one that we're going to think about, so that you also must forgive. Above all, 
Clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So that image of what we're supposed to portray is all held together with love, the way that we show compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. All of those things are filtered through love. You can see him presenting the image of the way that we should live. Could you imagine if in our world, and let's just start with the church, our church, but the church universal. What if churches were known to be compassionate and kind, to have humility, to have meekness and have patience? You think the body of Christ would look a whole lot better if we just lived into that? I mean, I'm, I'm a preacher, and so it stings to read this. I mean, I've been a part of churches in my life that they, these, these were not attributes that describe the church. And so why would anyone on the outside looking in ever say, I want to be like that? They'd say, not a chance. Not even welcome in the door. He goes on in verse 15 to say, um, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. I love this. We've talked about peace in here so many different times. The word peace in the Greek is the word arene. It means to take something that's broken and put it back together as if it was never broken. So peace is a, it's a connection word. So, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So in our lives, as we live into Christ, as we become aware of that, um, we allow that peace, that connection to be what rules our hearts, to allow that peace of Christ to rule our hearts. We are connected. In this world we struggle with, we connect ourselves to all sorts of things. This is where we're supposed to be connected with Christ, um, to which you are called into one body and be thankful. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now this is always interesting. Because it's easy if you just read through this. You'd read, let the word of Christ, some translations say the word of God, dwell in you richly. It would be easy to say, well, that means scripture. And in some instances it does. But if you go back to the Greek, he literally says, let the logos of Christos dwell in you richly. So in other words, let the literal words, what Jesus said, or what, what the, Christos is the anointed one, whatever the anointed one said, allow that to be what dwells in you. And you say, Scott, why is, why is that important for us to mention? Because of what he says next, which brings in that being established. What he says next is teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. There is a, there is a part of our life together where we teach, where if somebody gets off track, you pull alongside them, you, you allow them to understand and see the truth, but you're doing that in light of Christ. That's why it's so important that we're living into this new image and not into something else so that you can help pull people along. He says, and with, uh, gr with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And, and so once again, back to living life. And as you do all of that, as you have gratitude in your hearts for the changes that have taken place, live into your, live into your life, singing hymns, songs, and spiritual songs uh, to God. And it speaks to the whole thing coming together. So you, you kind of see the imagery of what he's using, and, and you know, I had a lot more fun laughing about this in the first service. Y'all aren't all about fashion shows in here, although y'all are the most fashionable. That's not true. That is true. I'm sorry. I get myself in trouble. Um, but it, it, uh, it may be an oversimplification, but it is literally exactly what he does. He has them focus on Christ, and then he starts to speak to the image that is not portrayed in that, and then speak to the image that he's called us to live into. So you may say, Scott, what does this have to do with me and with my life? And there really are two things I'd, I'd like to mention. One is to those in here that are believers. And then the other, we'll, we'll talk to those who are maybe investigating your faith today or, or really trying to sort through on this. To those who would consider yourself a believer, I think it's important for us to wrestle with this. If we are truly the image bearers of Christ, if you're a believer and you've said, I, I have accepted Christ and, and you understand the way that Paul writes this, my life is no longer my own, I am now the image bearer of Christ, we from time to time have to take an account of who we are. Right? And, I, and I wonder if we were honest, if we would, if we would say, what does so-and-so think when they look at me? Do, do they see something about my life that's attractive, and I don't mean attractive in, in this, attractive that would draw them into a relationship with Christ? Right? Because if Jesus was the image of God and, and God sent him to this earth and said, if you want to know me, get to know my son, well, it's the same thing that happens in our life. But a lot of times that's not the life that we live into. 
In fact, sometimes it's totally different and we repel people away from the presence of God or repel people away from wanting to know God because, because we don't look anything like the God that we serve. And so I think at some point as believers, we have to be willing to ask ourselves those tough questions and allow it to start shaping and molding and, and moving us in a direction where, where we are willing to position ourselves to be the inviting ones. Um, I didn't really go back and look at it, but if you go back and you look at verse 12, those beginning few words are so powerful. He says, as God's chosen ones. When you go through and you read scripture, who, who, what was the other group of people that he talked about as the chosen ones? The Israelites, right? So you think of the Israelites as being God's chosen people. You read about it in scripture. Now, my understanding of theology is that the Israelites were not God's chosen people to be exclusive of the rest of the world. My understanding was that the Israelites were chosen so that God could reveal himself to the world through the promise of Abraham that that blessing would be over all of the world. And so the way that you understand and the way that you live into that is two different things, right? So if you think that you, God has chosen you and, and said, oh, I just got you over here and just forget the rest of the world, then that's one understanding. That's not the way I read scripture. I think the Israelites were chosen to reveal God to the world. Well, here he's saying the very same thing, except for these aren't all Jews. Most of them are Gentiles. And he's saying, here you are, God's chosen ones. That's a strong terminology to understand the weight of them thinking about their lives now as being the chosen ones that will reveal, them, reveal God to the rest of the world. So I say all that to say that, that we really have to be introspective and, and search our hearts and lives. And don't let that be something that just crushes you. Remember that if you're here today and you're hearing this message and it's too heavy on you, know that you just begin and you allow God to start transforming you and bringing you along in this journey. And so to me, the, the second part, and, and this is me thinking about those who maybe are, are searching and investigating faith today. I, I pray that in this text th that you could maybe see the image of, of the God that loves you. The church hasn't always done a good job of representing God to you. And I'm sure that we're going to continue to mess that up from time and time again. How often do we try to change the world before we ever let them in the front door? When really the transformation is that as you are gaining knowledge, as you are growing, it's something that happens after you've been introduced to the faith. And so if you're investigating your faith, I pray that you can look past the imperfection of those who are the image bearers and that maybe you can see the heart of God that wants to engage you on a level that goes beyond the things that are so destructive in this world. All of that anger and strife and brokenness. And maybe you can discover that meekness and that kindness and that love that God has for you. Because truly, that, that's the story of our faith. It's a God that loves you and wants to connect with you. And maybe today, uh, you'll open up your heart and allow God to start shaping it. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the scripture. I thank you for Colossians. I thank you for those who were there in Colossae all those years ago that were wrestling with their faith, that as they read this text... They had to go through the very same process that we did to understand it. To really figure out what it meant to get rid of the stuff that wasn't in keeping with you. And God, I pray that you help us to do that. Yes, so that we can live lives that are rooted and built up and, and flourish. But God, most importantly, because we've been chosen to represent you to the world. We're gonna blow that up so many different times. But God, I pray that even in this moment that our hearts would be right and that we would lean into our faith and we would allow you to transform us so that when people see us, they truly see you. Not for our glory, God, but for yours. And for those that are searching for faith today, God, I pray that you would remove the boundaries, that you would remove all of the humanity out of the way and allow them to experience the grace of God, the love of God in a way that maybe they never had before. We love you, we trust you. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> well, we're going we're gonna to end the service today in, in, in a little different way. So if, if you have these cards in front of you, go ahead and pull those out, if you don't mind. And I'm just, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right up front. Um, you know, there, there are times in the, in the life of the church where the preacher has to get up on stage and say, we've got a big challenge and we need you. And so let me say, we've got a big challenge and we need you. 
but don't worry, I'm not going to get your wallet before the end of the day. By tomorrow. No, I'm kidding. This is not a financial conversation. Um, this is a conversation about human resource. In four weeks, we launch. So every fall, we get ready, we get geared up, and all the different ministries prepare. And when the kids get back in school, we have our fall launch, and we get ready for the most incredible fall season ever. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I'll set the expectation. This room will be full. People will be back from vacation, and they'll be excited about engaging sermon series, engaging life, and all the things that God has for them. Many new people that are searching for a church and trying to find that point. And, and the challenge that we have right now, and, and it's, it's probably because of COVID, because of the way the world has shifted, and, the, and just the lack of connection, the challenge of connection throughout time, is, is that we've, we've lost a lot of our connection in, in terms of volunteers, but the church is growing and it's moving, and there's this real energy that's moving towards a place of when, when launch hits, it's going to be crazy, and we don't have the people in place to really help us to meet the need that's going to be here. I mean, you've heard me say this before. I'm a firm believer that God will only give you what you're prepared to handle. And, and I honestly, with all of my heart, know that. And so as we pray for and we look for revival, and we look for God to do something incredible, I, I think we've got to be ready for it. Because God loves people and he's not going to send them to a place to where they're not going to be prepared to handle it. And so here's the big ask. Over these next few weeks, to make it possible for a Sunday to happen, we need literally almost 200 volunteers between all the services, week in and week out. And we're not even close. We have many, many people that have been doing this, but we're not even close. And so for this fall season, I would love to lean into your heart and your connection to community life and ask you to do something that maybe you've never done before. And that is to, to find an area in this church where you can plug in and you can connect and you can volunteer. I'm not asking you to give your soul to a ministry four weeks out of the month and that you'll never be turned loose of. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to start a journey volunteering until you find a place to where you can have that outflow and expression of your life somewhere in the life of this church. So on this form, there are multiple ministries, not an exhaustive list, but there are multiple ministries. And we would love for you to fill out the front name, phone number, email, and then open up the inside and just look at it. See if there's an area in there where you can say from now till December, now till, you know, I can do this. Um, I'm willing to learn, I'm willing to be trained, I'm willing to pull alongside and, and really find my place, find my rhythm, and, and then circle it. And then on your way out, you can drop it in one of the baskets, hand it to someone at the table, but circle it, get it to us, and then we're going to reach out to you this week, we're going to connect. If you have no idea what you want to do, around the room, there are volunteers, you see the banners representing the different ministries, we'd love to talk with you. Love to tell you about some of them. Some of these people you need to get to know anyways. They're awesome. Um, go get to know them. Hear about the different ministries. They'll tell you about some of the opportunities that we have. If you're looking at this and you don't know and you're scared, but you know that you want to volunteer somewhere, just fill out the information, drop it off with us. We're going to call you this week and we'll work through and find a place for you to plug in. Um, I want everybody to be able to find that place and that rhythm. There's something about being connected to the life of the church and volunteering that allows you to be a part of the work that God is doing. There's an ownership that you have when you go home that is literally the, the outflow of your life. And you can say, man, I was a part of that. Directly, indirectly, I was a part of what God is doing. And so I'm asking you to really consider this. Husbands, wives, families, you can join, you can figure out how to do it all together. Um, so there you have it. Amen? Amen? All right, you guys are awesome. Um, I will be down front. If I can pray with you, anything about the service, if you have any questions, come see me. For those who are online, and for those of you who are techie, that's a word, did I create that? Create that? Um, you can text CLC serve to 94000 or the QR code. They're going to leave that up on the screen for a second. If you're at home, you're tech savvy. Take a picture of that QR code, and it'll take you to the page, and you can register that way. I, I appreciate y'all. I love you, um, and I'm excited about what God is, is going to be doing. And I'm really excited about getting to link arms with some of you. I've seen you for years and we've never maybe made those connections. So I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna pray, let you sit there because maybe you can fill this out while you're at your, at your seat. And then um, after I pray, when you're ready, you can run or go see my friends at the tables. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Um, 
I thank you for all the opportunities that we have. Every one of these ministries represents people. They represent connections. Now, the vision of this church, we connect people to your son, Jesus. And, and Lord, this is what this is all about. And so position us in such a way that, that we can be most fruitful in the ministry that you've called us to be a part of. And so we just release it to you today. I know that there'll be people here today that 10 years from now, they're going to say, hey, you remember that Sunday? We signed up for this. And this is such a big part of our lives now. I know those moments are going to happen and I'm looking forward to them. And so we just turn it all over to you, God. Let this be a great week where we see your hand at work in our lives. And it's in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a wonderful week. Thank you. No.